You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is June 20th, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, component testing for food allergy. Our presenter is Dr. Matthew Greenhaut. He's an assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor School of Medicine. Uh, welcome back to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, we're joined today by Dr. Matthew Greenhaut. Dr. Greenhaut is an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, and he's been particularly interested in uh, food allergy, uh, and uh, in particular, food allergy as it pertains to components, because right now, when we do IgE testing for foods, we're testing for the whole, al the whole food, and it turns out that foods are a complex mixture of lots of different things within them, and uh, each of those things may have different uh, uh, properties in terms of uh, causing allergic reactions. So we're going to find out more about that uh, from Dr. Greenhaut, who's made that uh, his interest. Right now, Dr. Greenhaut is talking to us from South Beach, Florida, where he um, it assures me that the scenery is nice and uh, everything looks good and perhaps a pina colada is in the, is in the cards coming up. So, Dr. Greenhaut, I'm going to uh, make you the presenter. You should see a little thing that says, show me, show my screen. Yep, got it. Click on that. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. And go ahead and uh, make, there you go. Thank you. Take it away, Dr. Greenhaut. All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to present this today. This is, I think, really going to be something um, that all of us will have to become intimately familiar with in the future because I think that this absolutely is going to be um, what we're using to sort of unlock some of the subtleties of, of making a diagnosis, not only of food allergy, although that, that's what I'm going to limit my talk today, but, but other allergens. Um, and I really do think that this, this will be really one of the uh, premier technologies to sort of unlock a lot of things that we struggle with. Hold on one second. Uh, Jay, any, any idea? Oh, there it goes. Okay. All right, so my disclosure. So I do lecture on this topic for Fadia, uh, both as a speaker and as a specialty consultant. Um, I'm a member of the medical advisory team for kids with food allergies. That's non-financial. I also receive research support from FAN, which is non-financial. Um, I, I do receive financial support from the college as well as a private foundation, um, and I speak on unrelated matters for both Nutritia and for Sepracor. So today's objectives, we're going to talk about the role of component-related uh, uh, diagnostic allergy testing, look at sensitization patterns that may be responsible for uh, some of the cases that we see, looking at an epitope level recognition um, to explain some of the cross-reactivities that may confuse us clinically and show how components can really be used to sort of unlock this. Um, we're going to review some of the specific tests and how they can be applied and then look at some of the literature that's come out already um, that showed how this can be used. So just to review, and I think that this is crucial given what we're talking about, um, the definition of food allergy, I think a lot of us are very familiar with what sensitization is. Sensitization is the presence of specific IgE, and that's either a positive blood test or a skin test. But, you know, I, I think as we're taught and how hopefully as most of us practice, that's far different than than being actually allergic to something. Allergy brings into the play clinical symptoms plus then the sensitization. So just an isolated allergy test really is uninterpretable if you don't know the clinical context behind that. And I do think that there is certain segments within the allergy community and certainly a lot of non-allergists who get confused with this sometimes and still go based on a positive test being pathognomonic for allergy when it really may not mean that. Um, some of the data to support this, we know that, for, for instance, some studies were published showing that a, a number of peanut-sensitized individuals don't actually have clinical allergy. Um, we know that a lot of individuals order these tests but really don't know how to interpret them, and they, they keep us quite busy. They, they tend to be non-allergists, but some allergists referring in at academic centers. Um, and we know that from the NIH panel as well as the, the work group report from the Academy in 2009 that not nearly enough challenges are being done to really diagnose and confirm allergy. Um, you know, the tests are good, but they're not going to bring you all the information that you need. And I think that that's just an important thing that we should lay out before we go any further. So the important thing is, are we practicing as we preach? Um, I think that remains to be seen. 
Um, hopefully, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to explain to you another tool that will help us become a little bit more specific from the test today. So in diagnosing food allergies, still the history and the physical are going to be your, your two most important keys. I find that pretty much everything that I need to know is told to me by the parent or, or by the patient. And you know the physical exam may or may not lead to anything else. But the history, if you learn to ask the right questions and really probe, you can figure out you know, what your tests are most likely to show and get a good pretest probability. For further confirmation, we do run tests, either um, aminocap or other specific IgE by serum or um, skin tests. At Michigan, we do both as a, as a matter of routine. But then I find that there are always some diagnostic curveballs that I see. And I, I categorize these into four types of patients. We have the sensitized patient who comes in with usually a panel of blood tests that are positive to a whole host of foods without any history of reaction. Um, then we have the patients who had a reaction, they're not sure to what, and come in with the same panel showing a number of things uh, are, are sensitized. Then we have the case where the skin and the serum tests are discrepant. I'm finding more lately that it's usually very weak immunocap tests. We use immunocap at Michigan as in most of the country. Um, really weak immunocap in comparison to large skin tests, and that can become confusing. And then we have the, the, the case of the child that might be possibly tolerant but still has a positive test. I mean, they might have had a history of a accidental exposure that was tolerated. So looking to the future, I think we need better tests that can help us sort of explain some of these, uh, these, uh, these confusing situations. And, and I think that this is where the components can be very helpful. So the basic diagnostic test that we have, the skin test, this is a direct test. It, it will assess mast cells that are bound to IgE in the skin. We look for wheels that are three millimeters or greater than the negative control. This has a very high negative predictive value, meaning that when it's not there, it's very indicative that there is no allergy. However, when it is present, we have a much more difficult time understanding what it really means. And the positive predictive value might approach 50 to 60% in, in, in the best case. And you really need to have a strong history to help bring that there. We know that false positive rates are high, a lot higher in adults. We know that some of this is dependent upon where you place the test. The back is a lot more reactive than on the forearm. Um, and with our food testing in Michigan, we do this only on the forearm, although we see a lot of referrals, patients who have been tested with the multi-headed device on the back, that when we test them on the forearm, we get a very different situation. So you just need to know what the precision of your instrument is and understand that it's not going to be comparable between devices all the time. Skin testing is very safe, um, a very, very small reaction rate. Um, although interdermal tests for foods um, has been viewed as, as slightly uh, more dangerous, um, although this, this might be something that changes in the future as well. I think with any test that you run, you want to make sure that you have valid positive and negative controls because you can't interpret your tests otherwise. With serum testing, this is an indirect test. You, you have no assessment of what's actually bound on the mast cell, but you know what the three levels of specific IgE look like. And this is a quite, uh, quite a sensitive test. It will, it will tell you very precisely how much is in the blood if it's there. Um, this has evolved out of the RAST technology, which used radioactivity, um, which is an indirect amino assay. Um, when it was first established, the RAST test uh, class 3 tended to correlate with positive skin tests. With the switch to the, immuno, uh, the amino assays, such as the immunocap, which are fluorescent um, and ELISA-based, this has become a lot more sensitive. It allows for a higher degree of quantification um, and quantitation of, of the levels that are there, to the point that several prominent researchers around the world have looked at immunocap levels as cutoffs for where you may or may not want to do a challenge. Um, I will say that high core and Siemens make very similar tests to immunocap. And if you don't look closely, you might not notice the difference because the units are pretty similar. However, all the research pertaining to diagnostic cutoff levels are very specific to immunocap, and they do not apply to the high core system. And there was a study done a couple of years ago out of Mount Sinai that actually showed that for the same allergen that the three systems did not align. So just be careful. Um, I know that LabCorp does not use immunocap. Uh, Quest does. So um, at a basic level, just make sure you know what you're running. These tests are less specific and a little bit less preferred for initial diagnosis than a skin test, um, but it does have a high clinical utility in following um, trends over time. Um, these are some of the other panels um, that are on the market, including the immunocap. Um, use of the word RASP really should be discouraged because it, it really doesn't exist anymore. Everything that's sold now is, is fluorescent-based, um, and there's no more radioactive acids. 
So in looking at how we can use these diagnostic tests, as I said, uh, it was Hugh Sampson, booked in 1997 and in 2001, published the initial studies on this out of his atopic dermatitis population at Johns Hopkins. Um, basically, what they were able to do is look at where somebody's level was on immunocap um, at the time they were challenged and correlate a probability uh, to show what your level is versus your challenge outcome. The challenge outcome is going to be very simple. You're either going to pass or you're going to fail. And you can correlate that through a statistical test called a receiver operator characteristic curve. And basically, that, that's plotting the, the true positive versus the false positive. Um, and you can see here on, the, is everybody seeing this pointer? Um, you can see here that for Peanut, what he found in his population was that the probability of having a reaction approached 95% when your Peanut score was 14 kilounits of antibody per liter or higher. Um, now, you know, and, and, and that, that's been something that's really stuck in our literature and has become sort of a hard and fast rule that you don't cross. Um, there are a lot of things that may or may not apply to your patient population based on his study. Uh, for instance, his prevalence rate of allergy at that time was adjusted to 10%. That may or may not be what you're seeing, um, and that's going to affect the calculation of the probability. The other thing is that these numbers are just suggestive of where somebody may react, but like a baseball batting average, a 250 hitter might get a hit three times that night. You, you know, you, you, and this is just the probability. I'm sure if anybody's played blackjack, you violated the probability that you're going to lose you know, 97% of the time if you've ever walked out of the casino with money. So again, these are probabilities. These might be able to help you stratify your risk uh, aversion in terms of the types of patients that you might be more comfortable in challenging, and they provide helpful guide points for where you might expect the reaction, but this is not an automatic predictor. Numbers Matt, that have been established. Yeah, Matt, I, no, I noticed that um, under under the 14, it doesn't drop to zero. I, I often hear, well, if it's under 14, then they're not at risk, and that, that's not true, is it? Right. It, it's a sliding scale of probability. I mean, you can look along the curve, and you can see, you know, you just draw a line straight down, a line straight over. You know, at uh, so basically, the, the lower limit of, it's not detection, but quantification on an immunocap system is 0.35. And, you know, again, that doesn't correlate to an absolute 0% risk, according to the original study. You know, you can say they're probably 30% likely to react, and that that's considered a safe number. But again, you know, this doesn't, the, one of the flaws of the immunocap system is that it doesn't go down to an absolute zero. So, um, you know, these things can tell you, again, approximate probabilities, high or low. I think in general it's accepted the larger your skin test, the larger your immunocap test, probably the more likely if somebody's really allergic that they are going to react. But again, they're not absolute cutoffs. Um, in, in, in the original study, he defined um, these levels. Um, tree nut, fish, soy, and wheat have pretty much dropped out of most literature citations looking at this. Um, and the levels that are concentrated on are egg, milk, and peanut. You can see that egg and milk have cutoffs for smaller children. Uh, less IgE is needed to bring that probability that one may react. Um, and egg, milk, and peanut are the three that you're going to see pretty much as the, the, the most cited. Now, I will say, in Europe, there are different levels for this. And at different centers, there might be different levels. So again, what he has put out is a, a way of thinking about this. but. You know, this, this should not be necessarily considered dogma. You need to look at your patient population and look at the original study and see, do you agree with the methodology? Do you agree with everything? And then can I apply this to my patient? I, I can't do this 100% of the time at Michigan. But again, just because somebody is likely to react, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't challenge them. That's a decision that you should make with, with your patients. If they're willing and able and they understand the consequences, then if they want to be challenged, you know, that, then you should challenge them. They, they may need to be treated, but we're, we're trained to do that. So. Now, some of the other applications, I said, looking at things over time, we do know that there's a rather tight correlation between a, a drop in the absolute quantity of an immunocap score to an allergen over time um, and an increasing probability of tolerance. And this was a study that looked at milk and egg levels, uh, uh, and it shows that over, over time, the more steep your decrease, the more probable you are to be tolerant. And I think that that's how most, pace, most, uh, most providers are using this now. We check this every year. Um, what we find anecdotally is that the tests tend to lag in a lot of patients, whereas the immunocap levels will drop. Um, so that, that might be something that you want to follow over time. And it doesn't have to be every year. I do it every year because sometimes I have nothing more to offer my patients than the hope that maybe 
your levels have dropped and we can talk about, you know, is this a time when you want to do a challenge or not. But, um, you know, the levels may not necessarily change in a year or two years in some individuals. But, again, this is just another way of thinking how these can be used to sort of help you determine when somebody may be approaching a point of tolerance. So, in summary, with our present allergy test, we do have a number of constraints. A test cannot distinguish somebody who's just sensitized versus somebody who's allergic. They can help you get a clue about what patients might make up uh, the, the allergy component if you can couple that to a history. But again, an isolated test really is uninterpretable. These are all imperfect tests. Again, the way I explain this to the patients sometimes is that these tests are much better when they're negative. We're pretty sure that you don't have an allergy when you have no antibody. When they become positive, it becomes a lot harder for us to explain what that antibody may mean. So again, that's high sensitivity and poor specificity. We also have no idea what the major allergens are that make up a particular test. When you test peanut, peanut is a composite of a number of different parts, and we're going to talk about that in, in, in particular. When you have a positive and on an immunocap, it's the F13, that's, that's just telling you I recognize any part of peanut. It's not telling you what specific part or parts, and that actually may make a difference in your phenotype. Um, you know, and again, what I want you to consider going forward and as we jump into the actual component part next is that not all parts are equal. Um, one of the weaknesses with, with the present test is that we don't have a good way to determine what's cross-reactivity that's just because you're recognizing similar parts or what's cross-reactivity that's going to confer symptomatic allergy on somebody. And again, and that's something we may be able to unlock with components. Um, a word of caution about looking at large scores. These are approximations of probability of reaction, but that reaction might be just small in terms of highs, or it could be anaphylaxis. There's no test that can tell you how strong your reaction is going to be. There are some tests that may tell you how probable it is. And I think that I, I see a lot of, of, of this specific interpretation error being made in practice. I see very often um, kids sent in with a peanut score greater than 100 saying severe life-threatening allergy will have anaphylaxis, and that's how it's explained to the patient, which really is quite inaccurate. So again, size of the test or the magnitude of the immunocap will only determine a relative probability. So let's move into the molecular part of this talk. What is an epitope? An epitope is the 3D binding site for an allergen. It can be recognized by both IgG as well as IgE. We know that there's no universally common structure that's, that's, that's uh, uh, common to all allergens. Um, but we do know that certain things tend to aggregate in families and to be cross-recognized between different types of, of certainly plant foods. Um, there are two types of epitopes. Conformational epitopes are things that happen when you get complex protein folding into tertiary and quaternary structures, and you can bring together um, segments of amino acids that are separated in a linear fashion otherwise. Um, these tend to be more heat labile types of allergens. Um, subjected to uh, hydrolysis, they tend to unravel. And I think the prototype for this is what happens with milk and egg as you start to heat it over 350 degrees. These are conformational epitopes that tend to uh, basically unravel, and most patients will have tolerance if, if those are what they recognize. In contrast, linear epitopes are sequential amino acids. These are very heat stable. They're not alterable. Um, and there's some evidence that with certain foods, such as peanut or tree nut, the more you heat these things, the more of these epitopes you actually may express. Um, and a simple pictorial, I think, is well explained by this. This is from Dr. Sampson's article in 2004, where you can see sort of conformational epitopes here brought by protein folding as opposed to um, se uh, sequential or linear epitopes that are, are, are going to be less likely to be degraded. Looking inside the anatomy of allergen, we, we do have names for these families of epitopes. They do tend to fall into a couple of common things. And, and uh, if, if you've read any recent food allergy studies, you'll see uh, a, a lot of these names being tossed about. And, and if you're up on the pollen literature as well, you'll see this. Um, we have pathogenesis-related proteins. These are plant defense proteins um, that are expressed under certain uh, degrees of stress in nature. There are 14 groups. Six of them account for the majority of plant-based cross-reactivities. Uh, most of you should be familiar with BET-V1. It's the major uh, birch pollen allergen. This is uh, something that causes a lot of cross-reactivity like through patients who have oral allergy syndrome. This is uh, one of the prototypical natures of it. Um, seen across fruits, vegetables, as well as nuts. Um, and there's some cross-reactivity with other groups, such as the PR10 protein. Profilin is another example. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this. The lipid transfer protein, seed storage proteins. Um, at the bottom, I do want you to pay attention to something called cross-reactive carbohydrate determinants. Um, right now, when you run an immunocap test, when you have something positive, um, 
there's a good chance that it might be these cross-reactive carbohydrate determinants. They're seen in a number of pollen-allergic individuals, and these can elicit false positive, or not, not false positive, but uh, they're, they're positive, but just not what you're looking for, per se, um, and, and, and can be quite misleading. On the CAPS, we, uh, from, from uh, talk with, with the, the representatives of FADIA, that the, that the, the level of, of, of CCD cross-reactivity when you run some of the more advanced tests um, is not being seen to the level that it was with, with the original immunocap. But again, it's something to be uh, aware of. And, and again, when you have somebody who has a positive test, you know, you could be reacting to one or many of these, these different components. And these are a, a, a nice example of some of the epitopes that correlate to these families. Again, with lipid transfer proteins, ARAH9, which is a peanut protein, core A8, a hazelnut protein. You look at some of the seed storage proteins. Again, you'll see peanut is representative here. Um, the PR10s, BET V1, <coughs> sorry, soy. Uh, again, you know, you can take a look at this, and you can see that there are a number of things, and some of these will cross-react. And when you're looking at a test that can only tell you, yes, I recognize any part, or no, I don't recognize any part, it, it's important to understand what, what the parts might be that are being recognized because what you deem positive might be technically positive but sort of not in the way that you might be thinking about. So, and as we go further into it, I hope that that point will become a little bit more clear. Do these predict cross-reactivity? So, for example, if you go, go back one slide again, um, if you're sensitive to, uh, like, say, CYP-C1 and GAD-C1, uh, are, are you likely to is, be allergic to both of those, or is it just one or the other? How cross-reactive are they if they're in the same epitope family? They're, they're very cross-reactive amongst the same family. Now, again, without doing a challenge, it's very hard to determine if you're independently reactive to one, the other, or both. But at a chemical level, when you're recognizing similar structures, um, it's going to be very hard for that antibody to ignore something that looks almost identical. Um, and, and you do you see that, and, and it, I, I'm not sure. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, yes, yes. So, so technically you could just choose like a representative of each family and test for that and get an idea about likely sensitivities to other species. Yeah, I, I think that's certainly one application, and I think looking at, uh, I think it was the, the, the guidelines for writing immunotherapy when I was a fellow, the ones that came out I think in 2006 or 2007, sort of suggested testing for representative groups, you know, amongst the grasses where you have high cross-reactivity or whatnot. I mean, it's basically, this, that's, a, that's a very similar application that you could run with these tests, assuming that you, you understand which groups are related to what. Um, some of the tests, as we talk about, though, there, there are two of these tests that are available on the market now. One of them sort of does this for you. They will blow up and they will show you 108 different ways that you could possibly cross-react. So it mm -hmm. might be information overload. Uh, the other test, you sort of have to choose your components wisely, what you want to see if they do cross-react. So. so what are components? Um, components are, are basically the, 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 the parts that make up an allergen. Um, the way that I would, I would explain this to a patient would be to take a bag of Skittles, dump it out on the table, and start separating everything out by color. And you get the different components that might make up your package of Skittles. Uh, and I, I think that that's probably a useful analogy for, for physicians to use as well. You know, the crude extracts will, will tell us limited information because it's looking at the composite picture as opposed to the sum of the parts. Um, we know that each of these parts, though, can independently bind an antibody, and it has its own signal. and um, and as I believe will emerge, it's its own predictive values for how likely you are to be allergic to something as well. We know that there's a lot of cross-reactivity. We also know that uh, a lot of uh, recognition is not necessarily allergenic. And, and as we go through, we'll, we'll show more examples of that. We know that you know if you take the peanut, for example, you have error H1, you have error H2, and you have error H3. And I'm going to show you research that shows that if you tend to recognize these uh, these three epitopes, you're probably going to have symptoms when you ingest peanut. And the type of symptoms that you see may range from hives to anaphylaxis, but I think when you think of your prototypic peanut allergic patient, they're going to be overrepresentative in terms of recognizing these three parts. Era H6 is an emerging component as well that's probably going to fall into the Era H1, 2, and 3 category in terms of what it might predict. Mm -hmm. However, Era H8 and Era H9 are different animals altogether. These are things that are in peanut because peanut has evolved from a common plant precursor, and these parts have been duplicated over time. You can independently recognize these, but 
these tend to be patients who, and I'll show you this study, um, tend to not have symptoms when they ingest peanut. And these might make up your false positive uh, group when you're looking for clinical symptoms. Um, but again, if you run a standard peanut test and somebody's positive, right now it's impossible to tell which of these, which of these markers are, are being recognized. So um, for me, and I deal with a lot of peanut allergy, this, this tool is invaluable. And this is going to become something that um, I, I plan on using a lot because I, I just can't get this type of information with the current products that we have. And again, there's, there's also CCD, which can also throw off your signal to some degree. So component tech detection is basically an allergen microarray. This is evolved out of DNA biochip technology. You have multiple micron-sized proteins. They're covalently bound to a glass slide. But each individual protein that you plate down is its own ligand, and it can detect an antibody and, to, and give off a signal. Um, this is run on a fluorescent plate reader. It allows for multi-spot analysis, and there's an algorithm that correlates the signal intensity uh, to show you how strong the recognition is or how weak it is. Uh, one of the beauties of this test is that you can run several patients on the same slide. They have little grids that you can drop the blood in. Um, this requires about 20 microliters of blood, and you can get over a, a hundred different analytes out of this, which is a very robust test. Um, and this is allowing for analysis of the different components or epitopes. And this is a nice pectoral, um, assuming that you don't have to squint to see it. But again, you've got your covalent binding to the glass plate, and each one of these can be recognized. You drop the serum on, it, it will bind, there's a wash off, um, if you've ever run an amino acid, it's very similar to that. Um, and then it goes through the, uh, sorry, it goes through the plate reader and you get a fluorescent score that looks something like this. And it tells basically the intensity of the binding. And that can be quantified. Um, and the commercial products have a, 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 a printout just in the same way that like the immunocap or the high core system has, you know, a system to tell you how, how strong this is and what they think it means. So how are we going to use these tests? Well, as I've been talking about, uh, I think one of the major applications that we're already seeing is looking at cross-reactivity versus primary sensitization. And what that might allow is for certain risk stratification categories for the specificity of somebody's allergy, meaning that, say, if you only recognize error H8 or 9 versus error H1 or 2, that might give you uh, a little bit of a different perspective on how peanut allergic you might be. Um, it might also be something that can help us uh, stratify risk for somebody becoming tolerant. Um, though I'm not going to talk about this today, there are some papers that are written about sort of using this as a staging process for putting somebody on immunotherapy. Um, and, but overall, I think that its greatest tool will, will evolve into sort of being able to predict clinical reactivity and severity from, from how you recognize the different components. And I, I think that that's something that will be very, very valuable to our field. So let's look at an example. So on, on your left here, you have uh, looks like an older child being tested here to soy with a, a lancet on the volar surface of the forearm, um, a very precise technique. And the allergist is telling him that his test to soy is positive. But what does that really mean? And again, looking at it, could this be recognition to glium 4 or glium 5, glium 6, glium 3? glium 2, or CCD. And again, when you look at just a positive skin test that's looking at a crude level, you really don't have any idea what might be overrepresented in that bunch. It could be all of them. And with these component tests, you could run the same test and start to get a look that you've got some recognition of this part, that v one or other pathogenesis-related proteins, or profilins or CCD, and that might give you a little bit more insight into maybe this is a heavily plant allergic patient and there's cross sensitization with peanut, but I wouldn't, or I'm sorry, with soy, but I might not predict that this patient is going to have severe symptoms when they, when they ingest soy. And again, and that, that's just one application. The concept of epitope mapping, though, I think is really going to evolve out of this technology. By epitope mapping, I mean the elucidation of the number and the types of epitopes that are recognized in a particular patient. This used to be done by, first it was, it was by simple Western blots or, or, or immunoblots, um, which was labor intensive. And then it evolved to a more specific technique called spot technology, which was very similar to the immunoassay, except that you used a paper bound system, um, small linear fragments of, of peptides that were overlaid. It was very labor intensive. Now you have these commercial microarrays that are available. Um, and again, you can look at both IgE and IgG4 binding. Um, <coughs> and this can show the diversity of the patterns of recognition. 
And again, what, what I'm saying is that this may correlate to um, being able to show patterns of allergen severity or of allergen persistence. And again, I think this will be very, very useful going forward. Um, and some other uh, some other ways to look at this, again, beyond phenotype or cross-reactivity. Again, you can get a map of what's recognized because over time you might see shifting in certain epitopes being recognized versus other ones uh, not being recognized. Um, and, and you can see that in, in the next slide that, that we talk about with milk uh, and, and egg. Um, some of that has been shown early on, uh, well before the microarray was invented, actually. Um, you may be able to look at future risk, and again, overall, I think this is just going to be a tool that in combination with the skin test and with the, the history is really going to enhance your diagnostic accuracy. So the example I was talking about with milk, so on the left is an old study from about 2002. These are um, spot technology, and again, you have patterns of patients who were shown to have persistent milk allergy or transient milk allergy, meaning they had outgrown it at some point in their childhood. And you can see that looking at the different types of caseins as well as alpha-lactalbumin and beta-lactoglobulin, those with persistent milk allergy are recognizing different epitopes than those with transient. And again, this allows you to sort of now look inside the parts and stratify your groups of patients into, you know, at least at this level, who's, out, who's outgrown it, what do they look like, who isn't outgrowing it, what do they look like. And that's very useful. And again, one of the key things is, of, of this study showed that these certain casins were overrepresented in persistent milk allergics, but beta lactalbumin uh, was overrepresented in the transient patient. Flash forward about six years to basically the same type of study that was done with milk, looking at how this shows up on a microarray. The blue represents IgG4, the yellow represents IgE, and again, you can just see a whole map of the different regions of recognition. And again, this is sort of an advancement of the technology, but again, it's telling you the same type of information. It's looking at the different types of patients from those who are tolerant and those who are allergic and showing you what are their recognition patterns. And, and you can group that and graph it and do with it what you may. Uh, but again, it's highly specific information. The, the recent stuff on components is really centered around peanut and, and probably because there's more evidence that peanut is, is growing in importance in terms of allergy not only in America but, but across the world. Um, and if you look at the self-reported or, or telephone uh, rate uh, uh, parts of uh, reactivity across the United States, you can see that over the last 10 years that the incidence of peanut allergy has jumped. So this is something that a lot of investigators really want to figure out what's going on, how can we protect our patients, how can we predict who's going to outgrow it. Um, this was a patient in, this was a, a study run in England. Um, this is a cohort of just under 1,100 kids followed from uh, birth to age 7. At age 7, they looked inside the cohort and found 110 children that were sensitized to uh, to peanut. Of those 110, they found 12 cases had very, very convincing histories and they elected not to challenge them. The rest of them they challenged. They found another seven cases that were positive by challenge and 66 that had no clinical reactivity after challenge. From that group, uh, after they were able to get everybody consented and whatnot, they decided to add another 19 community-based cases that they knew were definitely peanut allergic by history and by challenge um, to make up their, their sample. And all these patients were subjected to the blood allergen microarray, which was um, uh, the FADIA product called the ISAP, which is the 20 microliter uh, uh, product that can run up to four patients at a time. And they looked at the peanut scores. What they found uh, in this is that of those who were sensitized, uh, they found that 10% were sensitized, but only 2% were clinically reactive, which is a pretty amazing number. But we've heard that before, that not everybody who's sensitized is necessarily reactive. What they did find were, though, that these, um, these points of decision that have evolved over time, 14 or 15 kilounits of antibody per liter for a peanut on the blood test and 8 millimeters on the skin test, overclassified allergy by 17.3% and by 15% respectively. That's a lot. You know, in terms of looking at, at, a, at a decision point where I think most people would say if you're at 15 or higher, I'm not going to challenge you. If you're wrong 15% of the time, you're, you're really limiting somebody's quality of life and not being fair to them by, by allowing them to at least be challenged and, and prove that maybe I'm in that 15% that, that doesn't react. So, um, you know, and that, that's not something that hasn't been talked about either, how exact these points may be. But using a, a component resolved uh, technique, they showed that there was some overclassification. What they did show is that the patients who were sensitized but not reactive tended to cross-react with CCD and grass. And again, because of epitope cross-reactivity, 
again, you can now show what parts you're reacting to and, 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 um, and take a look to see how structurally similar that is to other things found in nature. They did find that the reactive patients, though, were recognizing area H1, 2, and 3, and that, that's not a new finding. Um, but what was new was the fact that when they when they restratified and looked at, at, at a number uh, looked at this question a number of different ways, they found that specific recognition of era H2 was the most predictive uh, uh, thing that that predicted if somebody was going to react, and that's new. I think you know era H2 has has certainly been talked about in terms of importance in the past, but this is the first study that really cemented with the specific recognition that you were highly highly likely to react, and that's something that we may now want to use in practice to confirm when you have somebody who's really, uh, you know, who's peanut reactive, do you really want to see what they're recognizing? Can you pin it down? If they're ARAH2 positive, that might bode a little bit worse for them. Looking at the specific, uh, specific uh, parts of this study, these are receiver operator characteristic curves. <coughs> the um, ideal curve is going to basically follow sort of the left line and the top line, and that's your 100% specificity. With ARAH2 in green, that was the line there compared, and then this was the non-reactors. And you can see there's a huge difference between the two that's not reflected very well in the other two epitopes that were looked at. Um, and that was the evidence that they were presenting in this study. So based on that, they decided to look at this a little bit more closely. There are two products that can do this now. One is, is microarray-based. The other one is very similar to a standard immunocap, but is looking at just the actual components in the same quantified measure um, that the immunocap does. The ISAC, one of its weaknesses is that it gives a semi-quantitative printout, um, no recognition, low, medium, and high recognition, which, um, you know, it's not as exact as, as what we've been used to looking at. Um, but again, what they showed in their previous study was that these current cutoffs um, were probably a little bit misleading, and they found that error H2 recognition seemed to be the best discriminator in that group of patients of who really had peanut algae and who didn't. They took the same 29 challenge-confirmed patients um, and the 52 tolerant patients and looked at this now with the Aminocap Highly Resolved product, which is um, the more specific uh, component product that's offered by Fadia right now. And again, these are not the, uh, the, well, these are the only two products available in the world that will do this commercially right now, but at, at a research level, there are several investigators in the United States who have their own sort of in-house microarrays, but on a commercial basis, um, right now it's the Fadia products, and that was what was used for this study. And again, they looked at peanut-specific IgE crudely as well as area H1, 2, 3, 8, 9. And what they showed was quite amazing. When they looked at the quantitative levels, the specificity of binding to error H2 had a 0.99 on the receiver operator characteristic. That, that's almost 100% perfect. Um, and that's not something that you usually see. A lot of them you know, approach high 80s, low 90s, but this was 0.99. Um, in contrast, error H1 had a, 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 a calculation of 0.84, and crude peanut extract 0.85. And what they found was that error H2 at any level uh, of recognition on the scale, which is 0.35 or higher, um, had 100% uh, sensitivity, 96.1% um, specificity, and 97.5% of cases were correctly classified. That is a very amazing statement. That's showing you that looking inside, picking one part, you can now pin down really what you need to look at to make an accurate diagnosis for peanut allergy. And, and for me, both in clinical practice and in research, that's something that's going to be very, very useful uh, going forward. And you rarely see tests that are that accurate. Yeah, I, I would say I, I really haven't seen any other study that had a test that showed that much accuracy. This curve here is basically the, the curve for error H2. Um, you can look at the other ones. If anybody's interested in this, this article was printed. Uh, it was in Jackie from, I think, March. It was a letter to the editor. You, you can look at, at, at these values um, yourself in a little bit more detail. Um, again, though, looking at the cutoff points at 0.35, again, 97.5% uh, of cases were correctly classified, 96% specific, 100% sensitive. Looking down at whole extract for peanut, again, you know, 96% uh, specific, but rather insensitive, and a lot of cases were not correctly diagnosed. Looking at a higher cutoff point, even, you can increase the specificity, but you do that at the cost of sensitivity. Um, and and these, these tests have a very, very tight relationship. When you start to tinker with going up on one, you're going to compensate by going down on the other. Um, but at, at this level, it seems to be very good. So something to think about is these tests gain more uh, application in the market. 
the U.S. experience with this, so that was a, a study done in England. Um, this is an abstract that was presented by Bob Wood's group at the Academy this year, uh, basically looking at the, the same type of, uh, of situation. They had a number of patients that um, 29 had failed challenge to peanut, 34 had passed. They looked at the same levels and found that there was a difference in recognition between era H2 uh, being highly recognized in those who had failed challenge versus passing challenge. Um, and conversely, they found that era H8 tended to be over-recognized in those who had passed the challenge. Um, they found that era H1 and era H3 were not predictive, which is consistent with the study uh, from England. And again, they, they showed that at the minimal level of quantification, 86% um, of those who failed challenge were era H2 uh, positive, and 74% of those who had passed the challenge were era H2 negative. And again, that's, that's conferring a high degree of specificity to what you're looking at. Um, when they dropped it down, and you can do this uh, if you manipulate the machine, you can actually go down to point 0.1, which is the absolute zero scale for the body of machine. Um, even at that small amount of recognition of error H2, they correctly identified 94% who passed their challenge and 62% who failed. So um, I, I'm sure that other investigators will, will continue to tinker with this number. But again, what it's showing is that really any detection of error H2 is going to be a very specific factor that likely confers that you're are going to be symptomatically reactive when you ingest peanut. Um, and again, whoopsie, sorry about that. Um, and again, with 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 this in this line of um, this line of thinking, it's showing ways that you can break up the epitope recognition and then start to put patients into categories of likely react, likely not react. Um, you know, and and in contrast, this study had had been looked at to some degree earlier. Um, using spot tech, uh, well, using um, you know this was this was done before. It's been done with spot before, but it was also done with microarray. And again, looking at area H one, two, three, and six. Um, again, taking groups of patients that were uh, were challenged, um, and what they showed was that severity uh, in their minds was a, a, a determination of looking at the number, not just the absolute epitope recognized, but the number of different epitopes that you recognize, um, which is a measure of polyclonality. Um, that, in combination with, um, with your history of reactivity, gave you a much higher degree of, of predictability if you were going, to, um, were going to react. They also importantly found that there was no relationship looking at IgG4 epitopes in, in making any type of predictive statement. Now, this is a little bit in contrast to some things that are going on, especially inside some of the desensitization trials. They're looking to see if IgG4 levels rise over time as you become desensitized. I know that there's some theory with, with uh, venom immunotherapy that um, over time you see a decrease in E and an increase in G4. Looking at food, this may not behave the same way, but it's certainly a, a technology that you can look at within, uh, within the component-based uh, test, and you, you can get the G4, and you can get the E if you're interested in that. Again, I'm not saying that this is, there is or there isn't a, a role for it clinically, but in this study, there didn't seem to be a role for G4. Um, again, they showed that ERA H1 and 2 were, were very highly recognized among patients who reacted, um, but there was no dominant little sequence that they were able to tease out that, that had any significance. Um, but interestingly, when they retested these same patients 20 months later, they found the exact same pattern. So that shows, a little, you know, with some degree of time uh, that you're showing the same, uh, same patterns. It, it's a stable pattern, um, and that probably isn't going to bode well for one's chance of outgrowing the allergy. Looking at um, some other studies that have, have used the components, um, Again, you know, along the theory that most peanut sensitized patients may not actually be allergic, um, in Europe, this can be quite difficult given the degree of birch pollen um, and other tree sensitization that's there that, that will throw off the, 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 the detection to some degree. Um, in this study, they took 200 children that showed four patterns of sensitization to both peanut and birch. So you had your, your peanut and birch positives, you had your peanut and birch negatives, then you had your single positive to either peanut or birch. What they did was they took these patients, there were 50 in each group, and they ran the test according to the um, ISAC profile, looking at the peanut uh, sensitization. And when they, when they regrouped all these patients for those who had symptoms to peanut that were reported, 87% recognized ARAH1, 2, and 3, um, and didn't recognize ARAH8. Um, 
versus 18% um, who were symptomatic recognized ERA-H8 and didn't recognize ERA-H1, 2, and 3. And I'm going to say that those ERA-H8 recognizers were probably oral allergy symptom patients who had oral pharyngeal or whatnot. But again, it's starting to show the same thing, how you can segregate out these patterns of reactivity based on what's being, uh, what's being recognized. They did show, again, 97% uh, who had ERA-H2 and either had ERA-H1 or ERA-H3 co-recognition um, reported symptoms versus ERA-H2 alone, and that was clinically significant. So um, that's going back to the earlier slide, looking at some measure of polyclonality. So while ERA-H2 may be highly specific, um, again, you know, there are going to be some patients that are, are maybe a little bit worse off for recognizing more than one epitope. Um, and, and this is a tool that may help to be able to tease that out. They found that profilin, grass, and CCD sensitization was really not associated with being symptomatic to peanut. Um, and again, it, it's, a, it's showing how you can look at two components, ERA-H2 and ERA-H8, and look and see this group is going to be symptomatic and this group isn't. Internationally, um, you know, with the, with the, based on where you are in, 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 in the world geographically, again, you, there are areas that have higher degrees of, of tree pollen density um, and those who don't, particularly in, in, in Sweden, um, you know, where, where Fadia is located. Um, they've done a lot of research on this because it's very endemic for birch pollen. Um, but this is, a, this is a study that looked at three centers, one in Sweden, one in Spain, and one in New York. Um, and they wanted to look at the recognition profiles of their peanut allergic patients. And what they found, and this was run on the, the highly resolved components, so you're looking at quantified um, uh, measures to ERA, H1, 2, and 3, uh, 8, and 9. What they found was that in Spain, their allergic patients were less likely sensitized to ERA H1, 2, and 3, but more sensitized to ERA H9, which is reflective of sort of the local aerobiology there. And in Sweden, ERA H8. What they found was that the Spanish patients were also more likely to be monosensitized to just one epitope, where in the U.S. they tended to be um, polysensitized. The uh, U.S. patients tended to over-recognize ERA H1, 2, and 3. And again, that, that might be reflective of the center from which those patients were drawn from. But again, that, that's, again, looking at severely peanut allergic patients. Those are what they recognize. Um, and in other countries where you have other factors that might confound why, why you're recognizing peanut on a test, you know, you start to look at the aerobiology and you start to look at the parts of peanut that are very similar to the tree pollen. And you can start to make some deductions about what maybe they're recognizing and how severe or how likely their allergy may be. Um, what they found was that the U.S. children were also sensitized at a far earlier age, which um, I don't have a good explanation for, and neither did the authors. Um, but again, there are regional differences to sensitization that you need to be aware of. And again, if you see a patient who has a positive skin test to peanut who's coming from Spain or from Sweden, that might mean something very different than the peanut allergic patient in Kansas City or in Ann Arbor or wherever anybody else that happens to be listening to this today. Um, and even within the United States, I don't think that anybody could say that the patterns are, are similar enough that you might not see regional differences in the Pacific Northwest versus the Southeast versus the Northeast versus the Great Plains versus the Southwest as well. And that, that's a study that hopefully will be done. So in terms of, of the value of components, um, the immunocap test had actually been supplemented with components at a crude level earlier to try to enhance the crude diagnostic ability. Um, a good example of this was when they added Hep B5 to um, the standard latex test, um, and they found a 10% increase in sensitivity without a loss in specificity, and that, that's very valuable. However, when they added Core A1 to the standard hazelnut test, um, they found that it decreased its specificity because they were getting a lot of BET B1 cross-reactivity, and it created quite a mess for a while. There's actually a letter the editor written about this urging caution in ordering this specific test for a period of time. So. Um, you know, these are things that will constantly be evaluated to look at to see what they do. Um, the crude test might actually fall out of favor going forward if we're getting that much more information from the, the component tests. Um, when you do order component tests, um, at least the highly resolved, you will get a crude level as well. Uh, don't look to add up all the parts to make the, the sum of the crude extract. They're not really equivalent. There's, again, different recognition based on, on what, what that patient might be. Um, but again, would it be reasonable to use the crude as maybe a sentinel for a gateway to doing the components? If the crude's negative, don't do the components. If it's positive, then do them, that kind of thing, like an algorithm? I, I think that that's probably something that we will see happen. I, I, I would be a little more 
uh, than concerned if I saw positive components with a negative crude score. Um, but again, it might reflect just the threshold of 0.35 is not being uh, you know, reflective of a true zero, and there might be something lurking between 0.1 and 0.35 that the component tests are sensitive enough to pick up or not. So I think that that's a good question, um, but that remains to be seen. But I, I don't think that that thought line is, is uh, I, I, I think that that's probably something that, that makes a lot of sense and certainly something that I would consider in my, my thought process. But it, it, it may or may not be true. There's not a lot of data to support that yet or refute it. But. So looking at the two products that are on the market, and this slide is courtesy of Fadia. Um, this is their ISAC microarray. Again, it's got a, a hundred and it's actually up to 108 components now, um, 18 foods, 32 inhalants, uh, broken apart into its relative components. It's run very, very quickly from a finger stick, uh, from a finger stick. It gives semi-quantitative results. Um, it is commercially available but not FDA approved yet. Um, which means, uh, in all practical sense, uh, if, if you want to order this for your patient, they uh, will have to pay for it out of pocket and then potentially resubmit it to their insurance to see if they'll pay for it. Um, you know, again, it's available and it's there. Um, on the left, I'm sorry, on the right is uh, just a schematic of, of the binding and the throughput and what the image looks like, and it creates a very nice report. Um, that um, you can actually find if you go to the Pearl Labs site from Fadia, you can actually pull this up, which is where I, um, which is where I took it from. Um, and again, it can show you sort of the cross-reactive patterns based on what you see. One of the weaknesses of this product, admittedly, is, is that it might give you too much information. And I think over time, we're going to need to learn strategies to sort of suppress some of what we're looking at that we might not have been interested in. Um, certainly, nobody wants to run a huge screening panel uh, when you're only looking for one thing. Um, but, you know, again, it, it does look at a number of different things all at the same time, so that, that might allow you to sort of enhance the picture of potential cross-reactivity in a semi-quantitative fashion. The highly resolved uh, immunocap is very similar to um, the current product that, that most of us order or when we order what we consider to be a, uh, I don't like the term, but a RAS test, you know, and it goes to Fadia or Mayo. This, this is what's being run. This is an actual cap, uh, the nitrocellular sponge in here. Um, these actually, as of today, as of this morning, the, I got a, an email about the press release. For Peanut, this package is now FDA approved and commercially available. Um, it takes about two to five milliliters of blood, and it will give you a quantitative readout of, of your peanut epitope profile. It's available for about seven other foods as well. Um, it's graded on the same scale as the immunocat from 0.35 to 100 um, using the same machine, and it, it's not a microarray. So this may be something that all of us start using uh, in, in practice, uh, at least those of us who are interested in this and think that this, this might be able to enhance our diagnostic uh, capabilities. And these are some of the available component packages. Again, only the peanut right now that I, that I can say for sure is FDA approved. Um, if you go and do a Google search for the press release, you can find the other components that were, were released literally just this morning. Um, so some of the future applications for epitope-based testing, um, looking at the genotype and the phenotype and how that might relate based on what epitopes you're recognizing, relative risk based on your epitope mapping, um, enhanced understanding of sort of the components that make up the regional allergenicity of something. Um, and I do think that we may be able to look at strategies that would enhance potential treatments or cures going forward. And I'm just going to run through a couple of very quick case studies for, for some applications of how you may use this um, in practice. So the first case is a seven-year-old girl. She's had eczema since early childhood. It is well controlled with steroids, and she's mainly symptomatic in winter. Um, she's also got allergic rhinitis sensitive to several uh, uh, notorious things. Um, and she's got peanut and tree nut allergy that she's known about for several years. Um, she gets severe itching in her mouth when she eats peanut or mixed nuts. And, and interestingly, she told me that this also occurs when she eats apples and melons, and, and she hopes that she's not allergic to these as well. Um, the parents want to know if it's okay for her to now eat peanuts and tree nuts because it's actually been two years since the last time she ate this and had a reaction. Um, which, when I probed further, um, really meant that she had been sneaking these at school and, um, and actually hadn't been reacting. So they, they were very curious to see what, it, what does her blood test score look like, what does her skin test score look like, is, you know, doctor, she's still allergic. So on skin tests, she still has some reactivity to peanut, to walnut, 
um, really no reactivity to almond or cashew, um, but some reactivity to hazelnut, certainly reactive to birch. Um, and then on, on the immunocaps that her pediatrician had run, um, she had very low recognition of peanut, but high recognition of hazelnut. So how can we look at this in a little bit more of a specific way? What we can do is run component tests. And again, this is a simple printout. We're not representing all our, uh, components that could be on, on this printout, but we're looking at two for peanut and two for hazelnut as well as birch. So you can see, in terms of the markers of cross-reactivity with the PR10 protein, there's a high score to ERA H8, um, as well as um, a low score to core A8. However, if you look at those markers of severity, there's minimal recognition of ERA H2. I, I don't even think that you could get this level as, as, as being quantifiable. Um, I'm not sure why, why this number was chosen for this example, but there's virtually no recognition of ERA H2. So, what would you do with this patient? Well, what we could say is that the peanut and tree nut reactivity is really strongly suggestive of oral allergy syndrome, and mainly because she's birch cross reactive. But I wouldn't necessarily say go ahead and you know just be careful and only eat roasted nuts as opposed to raw nuts. I, that's something that I want to see proven through a challenge. So you know we are arranging for a double blind challenge to confirm this. The skin tests are positive because there is some degree of cross reactivity or cross reactivity. But I would say that if I had to, to pick, uh, you know, is, is this somebody who's at risk for anaphylaxis and hives from ingesting these things, or is this somebody who's really going to have oral pharyngeal symptoms based on oral allergy? I would say that this is probably somebody who's primarily tree pollen allergic, and you're seeing cross-reactivity with the foods. <coughs> In terms of counseling, these patients are all at risk for um, symptoms with raw tree nut, raw peanut, as well as raw fruit and vegetable. Um, and these are patients that I still recommend carrying EpiPen because there is a small but significant rate that will experience GI anaphylaxis from oral allergy syndrome. But again, looking at the components, this is a way to sort of break it up and, and help stratify where you may want to challenge or not. If you went just based on the 3 millimeter peanut skin test, some people might say, you know what, that's positive, I don't want you eating this. But you know, I'm not saying that she should eat this, but at least it helps me understand what's most likely to happen when she does eat it. And you can, you can make a very strong case here that this is oral allergy syndrome. This is another case of a 15-year-old boy. So he's got a history of asthma, symptomatic food allergy to peanut, but he also, um, when he was tested when he was four, when this happened, he also came up positive to hazelnut, although he had never eaten it. Um, he also has allergic rhinitis to trees. Uh, three years ago, um, he had an accidental kiss from a girl at a party on his cheek. Um, which resulted in a huge uh, uh, wheel-like rash of form on his, on his cheek. Um, at that time, he was seen by our division, um, was told that, you know, you're still peanut allergic, you know, from just a little bit of contact. You had this huge reaction. Um, and the statistics now are telling us that you're probably only about 20% likely to outgrow a peanut allergy. And your tree nut allergy, you know, you're positive to this. We know that 50% have co-allergy, whatever that might mean, uh, to tree nut. Um, and, and you're only 10% likely to outgrow your tree nut allergy. However, it's three years later, this kid is starting to take other risks in terms of behaviors that teenagers might uh, exhibit. Mom is a little bit worried he's going to be going off to a summer program. She really wants to know, is he really allergic? What can we do to help determine this? I don't want him to be taking unnecessary risks. So what we did is we ran both immunocap tests as well as skin tests. And again, you can see strong peanut uh, immunocap, weak hazelnut immunocap, a fairly strong birch pollen skin test, as well as a fairly strong peanut skin test. Hazelnut is still positive, a little bit of dermatographism on his negative control. Let's look now at his peanut components as compared to his hazelnut components. And again, you know, even though you have the, the high level of, of crude recognition, again, the, the sum of the components is not going to equal this total. You can see, though, something that's a little bit ominous. He does have high recognition of error H2. He's got, um, well, it's, it's over the 0.7 threshold for what we consider clinically significant for core A1. <coughs> so he's showing some markers of severity. Um, but he also, you know, not much in terms of cross-reactivity either. So this is a little bit more of a challenging case. What I would say is that he's still peanut allergic, and if you went by you know, the crude extract level of 59, you would probably predict that if you gave him peanut, he would react. Again, that's not a reason to withhold the challenge if mom and the child really want to know what will happen. But in terms of counseling your staff and whatnot, that might be something where you've drawn up an extra dose of epinephrine. 
you make sure that uh, you have a clear anaphylaxis management plan in, in line, and then you go ahead and you run your challenge. Um, but what we could say is that his hazelnut test looks very cross-reactive because of the high degree of birch pollen. And what we did is we went ahead and scheduled a hazelnut challenge with him that he passed. And, and um, while he might not be able to eat peanut, I think that what, what we plan to do now is go through all the tree nuts that he came up positive to, which I think are, are basically cross-reaction. And we're going to challenge him to each and every one of those. And we're going to prove to him that his danger is with peanut but not with tree nut. That's going to enhance his quality of life, I believe. Some, some parents feel a little bit different. Some practitioners feel a little bit different on, the, on that one particular issue. They may say one nut equals all nuts. I don't want any chance of possible cross-contamination or whatnot. But when, when I'm looking at ways to really help somebody who's probably going to take a risk, I at least want to, want to counsel them in the most appropriate and most accurate and most complete way that I can. So with this kid, um, you know, he's on the path to hopefully being shown that he can eat all these tree nuts but still can't eat peanuts. What we did counsel him in on, on was, you know, cases of contact reaction as well as salivary transfer of peanut allergy that uh, has been reported. Um, but again, through components, um, you know, you get a little bit more information and, and I do think that you're going to see this, these, these cases as sort of examples of how you can use this going forward. So, with that, <coughs> I will open this up to questions, and thank you very much. Uh, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, are there any comments or questions for Dr. Greenhawk? I had uh, two questions. Uh, go ahead. Um, this is uh, Ronnie Johnson, one of the um, uh, second-year fellows. Um, but I was wondering if any of the components um, uh, have been looked at to determine if uh, the rash is merely eczema that that uh, they always uh, um, that the patient always has, or is it you know can you tell is it you know going to be hives or anaphylaxis? And the second question is, uh, if LabCorp doesn't use Immunicat, what do they use? So let me answer the second one first. LabCorp uses TurboRast, which um, is a different technology. And if you look at the uh, 